If you would please take out your Bibles, let's turn to the book of Galatians tonight. Galatians chapter number 6. And we are nearing the end of our study here in the book of Galatians. And there are two things that I'm looking at possibly going in the direction of. We can't go in the direction of both. So uh, one or the other. Uh, maybe I'll let you know next week which one uh, we'll, we'll be move, moving in the direction of. But for right now, we're still in Galatians chapter number 6. And uh, as you look there, find verse number 11 if you would please. And we'll remain seated tonight if you promise to, to uh, read along with me like you're standing up. Amen. All right. Galatians chapter number 6, beginning in verse number 11, the Bible says, See how large a letter I have written unto you in mine own hand. As many as desire to make a fair show in the flesh, they constrain you to be circumcised, only lest they should suffer persecution for the cross of Christ. For neither they themselves who are circumcised keep the law, but desire to have you circumcised that they may glory in your flesh. But God forbid that I should glory save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom the world is crucified unto me, and I unto the world. Pray with me tonight. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, as we come before your throne this evening, I pray that you'd please encourage us, help us to grow, help us to understand, and then help us to take the truths that you show to us and, and apply them for your honor and for your glory. Bless now this time. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. Way back in the beginning of our study, the very first character of this letter to the Galatians that we noted was the fact that Paul wrote by hand the entire letter. And we saw, and we're seeing that again tonight. So we're coming back full circle, so to speak, from the beginning of our study. And so here in verse number 11, he says, See how large a letter I've written unto you with mine own hand. And we noticed back then how interesting it is that this fact was significant enough for Paul to draw attention to it, to the fact that he had written so large a letter with his, with his own hand. Honestly, it doesn't seem like a big deal. I mean, if Paul is the author, then shouldn't we expect that he has written it with his own hand? We then learned, if you remember back then, we then learned that Paul never wrote his letters in his own hand. Paul always had a scribe that he would dictate to, and then the scribe would take down the letter and write it for him. You're there in Galatians. Turn to the very next book in Ephesians, to Ephesians chapter 6. And most of your Bibles probably have a postscript at the end of the letter of Ephesians 6. And right there after verse 24, the postscript should say something like this. To the Ephesians written from Rome by Tychicus. Now we know that Paul is the author of, the human author of Ephesians as God used him to, to write it. But he had a scribe. By, by name of Tychicus, if you would please turn to the end of Colossians, the very next book over, and look at the uh, chapter number 4, at the last verse there, verse number 18, and there's another postscript, and there the, it, the Bible says, or the postscript says, written from Rome to Colossians by Tychicus and Onesimus. And we could go on, but you kind of get the idea that Paul usually had somebody writing for him. But here in Galatians, as you turn back now to Galatians chapter 6, we find something different. That Paul is saying, you have seen how large a letter I've written with mine own hand. Usually the only thing that he ever wrote in his own hand in his letters was his salutations. For instance, in Colossians verse, uh, chapter 4, the Bible says, The salutation by the hand of me, Paul, remember my bonds, grace be unto you, amen. In 2 Thessalonians, it says the salutation of Paul with mine own hand, which is a token in every epistle, so, uh, epistle, so I write. So he usually would, at the end of it, write a little salutation in his own hand. So highlighting the fact, here in Galatians chapter 6, highlighting the fact that 
he hand wrote this whole epistle signifies, Paul is signifying that this letter to the Galatians was unusually important to him. Important enough for him to sit down and write it out himself. In fact, we quickly learn as we read the letter that Paul was not happy with the the Galatians and the churches in in Galatia. Turn back to chapter 1 if you would please real quick and let's just review some of this and remember a little bit about Paul's writing and why he's writing and why he's upset. And Paul's not happy, and we see that right at the very beginning of the letter. The very first uh, few verses here, down to verse number 5, are really just introductory verses. When you get to the end of verse number 5, you'll see the word amen. So so he has finished his introduction there at the end of verse number 5. And he's getting right into the meat of the letter in the very next verse. And and he doesn't waste any time about what it is that's on on his heart. So right when he starts his letter in verse number 6, he says, I marvel... That ye are so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel. When the world is wrong with you, in other words. What, what are you listening to and why are you listening to it? And so again, he's not wasting any time to say that they are being led astray by the preaching of another gospel. Which, he says, is not really a gospel because any news that is not the same as the gospel news of the Lord Jesus Christ is not good news. And so he he alludes to that in the very next verse saying that really it's not another gospel. It's a perversion of the the true gospel. So look at verse number 7. Which is not another because there really is no other gospel. But there be some that trouble you and would pervert the true gospel. The gospel of Christ. And so it's a perversion that they are hearing this, this other gospel if you will. Now, Paul is angry because the false, these false teachers have crept in among the Galatians and have frustrated the grace of God. And teaching that righteousness does not, does not come by faith alone, but through the law as well. And in doing so, they have made Christ's death a vain thing. So so there's three things really that that Paul is upset about and the reason why he's writing. That they are frustrating the grace of God. That they are teaching that righteousness comes by the law. And in doing so, they have made the, the Christ's death of none effect. Now, how do we know that's what he's upset about? Well, look if you would please in chapter number 2 and verse number 21, which is kind of the theme verse of the book. And Paul says, I do not frustrate the grace of God. Meaning, in other words, that these false teachers that have come in among you are frustrating the grace of God, the gift of God, the work of God on your behalf. For if righteousness come by the law. And so he's saying, look, righteousness doesn't. If it did, then Christ's death is in vain. So they're frustrating the grace of God, teaching that righteousness comes by the law, therefore essentially making Christ's death vain. And that's what he's so upset about. And so, uh, in other words, their message takes the whole life and message and work of, of Christ and empties it of its meaning and of its value. If these false teachers are right, then God has wasted his time in sending his son. In other words, if you can save yourself, You don't need a savior. If there's something that you can do to make yourself right in the eyes of God, you don't need somebody to write it for you. You don't need the savior. And so in proclaiming this other gospel, that is not really the gospel, but that is a perversion of the real, they are teaching that you can essentially work righteousness into your own life and that makes the death of Christ and the work of Christ on your behalf vain. It empties it of any real meaning. And so the very character of God has been attacked and the people of the churches of Galatia are being led astray by this false doctrine. So yes, Paul is not happy. And so we are reminded here again near the end of our study that which we learned at the beginning. The reason why Paul was moved to write this letter. And so, so again, as you turn back to chapter number 6, 
He says, you've seen how large a letter I've written in verse number 11 unto you in mine own hand. He's not happy. He's upset. And, and, and he's writing about uh, this, this, this way in which this different gospel, this perversion of the true has made its way in and amongst the believers there in Galatia. And so he rehashes this. Look at verse number 12. As many as desire to make a fair show in the flesh, they constrain you to be circumcised. They want you too to enter into their folly, only lest they should suffer persecution for the cause of Christ. And so he's revisiting one last time as he's closing down his letter, this error of the false teachers. So let's start tonight with the idea of a fair show. That's what it says here in verse number 12. That these false teachers are trying to make, if you will, a fair show in their flesh. As many as desire to make a fair show in the flesh. Now the Bible warns us about the nature of our heart. You know the verse in Jeremiah where the Bible says the heart is deceitful above all things. And desperately wicked, who can know it? So there are three characters of our heart that the prophet Jeremiah teaches us about. And we need to understand about our heart. The heart is, number one, deceitful. That's what he says. The heart is deceitful above all things. By the way, you need to understand that that Satan may be the father of lies, but he cannot deceive you even as much as your own heart can. Right? Right? And so your heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. So number two, your heart is wicked. And and then the Bible says, who can know it? Your heart is unknowable. By the way, this is one of the reasons why God brings trials into your life. So that you can know really where you are. So as he squeezes... I, I think about uh, an orange, holding an orange in your hand and you squeeze it with your hand, you expect to get apple juice out of it, right? No, you don't. You expect to get orange juice out of the orange when you squeeze it. That's what trials do. They're, 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 they're like a hand squeezing the orange. And if you're the orange, what's supposed to come out of you? Orange juice, right? So if you squeeze a Christian, what should come out of a Christian? Christian juice. Yeah, exactly. Right? Amen. So if it's not Christian juice that comes out, something ain't right. If it's apple juice, and if it's apple juice instead of orange juice, when you when you're squeezing the orange, something's not right. And that's the idea of the trials. Why? Why does God do that? Because God knows that your heart is deceitful and and, and wicked, and you can't know it. That's why he squeezes. So you can know what's there and you can know what what needs to be done in your own life. That's the reason why you ought to count it all joy when you fall into divers temptations. Hmm. You might just be learning something about yourself. Clearly then, we should not follow our heart. That's the, that would be the wrong thing to do. Now I know that that's what the world says to do. Well, what is what does your heart say? Right? Just follow your heart. It's what the world would say. But from the scriptures we know that that's a fool's errand. As a matter of fact, the Bible says that it is. The Proverbs say, he that trusteth his own heart is a fool. To trust your own heart is a foolish thing to do. Why? Because it's deceitful, wicked, and you can't even really know it. It can be deceiving you and you not even know it. And so the antidote is the truth. That's why we need the truth. That's why Jesus said the truth shall make you free. One of the issues with, for instance, emotional Christianity is that emotional Christianity is not based necessarily on the truth. It can, but if your emotion first rather than intellect first, if your emotion first rather than truth first, then your emotion is going to lead you straight. You with me? And so Christianity is not based on the emotion, it's based on the truth. And whatever emotion comes from that truth, then all right, praise the Lord for that. But it's not first the emotion. You see, truth doesn't care about your feelings. You guys ever heard that before? There's a guy that says that. And, and that's true. Uh, 
truth doesn't care about how you feel. It doesn't matter how you feel. Truth is truth whether you have the right emotion in, in regards to the truth or not. It really doesn't matter. Emotion doesn't determine truth and it's the truth that should make you free. And so don't trust your heart. Trust the truth of the word of God. Therein is the right way. It's not found in your heart. It's found in God's truth. And you shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free. And so it is that we need a large ongoing diet of the truth. Why? Because again, your heart is deceitful and wicked and you cannot know it. You need to be packing the truth in as often as you possibly can. We need a large ongoing diet of the truth. But even then, even when we're trying to do right and trying to learn right and trying to learn the truth, our heart can fail us still. Why? Well, the Proverbs said this, There's a way which seemeth right unto man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. But yet it seems so right. How can it be wrong? How can it end in death when it seems so right, when it seems so logical, when it seems to make so much good sense, and yet the end there over the ways of death? Now we, now, we know all of this to be true. We can read it in the scriptures. We understand uh, the condition of our heart according to the word of God. We understand that, that it is a fool that would trust in his own heart and that we need the truth constantly and we need to keep turning to the truth. But even still then, we need to be careful because once again, our heart wants to interpret the scriptures. You with me? Rather than allowing the scriptures to come in and do their effectual work on us, as the Bible says... To cut down to the morrow. We want to kind of say, wait, well, wait a minute. What, what does this really mean according to the way that I see it or the way that I interpret it? You with me? We okay? And so we need to allow the, the, the word of God to speak to us rather than us speaking to the word of God. Let God tell us how to live rather than us telling God how we want to live. Because there's a way which seemeth right unto man. And so we know all of this and yet it's difficult for us to apply what we know about our heart because the truth is so very contrary to our way of thinking. God said that his ways and his thoughts are higher than our ways and our thoughts. That means it's very contrary to the way that we would naturally see it. And so because of that, our heart again is going to want to take and, and supersede the word of God by interpreting it in our own way. To our liking, rather than allowing the word of God to speak to us, we want to speak to God and say, you know, again, I don't see it that way or I, I need to interpret this thing differently. And so the truth is contrary to our way of thinking. The understanding of our heart, it just seems so right to us. And so that's, again, why it's so difficult to, to come around to the truth that we know. Because, again, the truth is contrary to our way of thinking, and the understanding of our heart seems to be so right to us. And then also because we don't like going it alone, and we don't like to suffer. So we don't like to be out there on our own. And sometimes the truth might be uncomfortable because it might put you out there on your own, right? And we don't like that. And so it's difficult for us to apply these truths that we know. And this, by the way, is exactly the reason why or how it is that false teachings get a foothold. All of the cults kind of come out this way because of this, this issue of our hearts. In other words, you can read the same scriptures and have, you know, different opinions or views of it. But what we really want is not your view or my view. We want God's view. Amen? But we struggle for it to, to find God's view and God, God's understanding. And because we do, all, all manner of interpretation come, right? Jehovah's Witnesses, Mormonism, a myriad of different Christian denominations, Catholicism, all of that stuff. And they all say that they're, they're based on the word of God. But there's this issue with the heart. And so here's how it works. The truth about God is contrary to a person's way of thinking. Joseph Smith, that was contrary to what he was reading about, was contrary to what he thinks the church ought to be. 
So he just thinks all churches are apostate and all churches are wrong. And so again, it's contrary to his way of thinking. When, the, when God said that the church is the pillar and ground of truth, Joseph Smith couldn't allow that to be so. As an example, you get the idea? And so somebody has this, it comes to the scripture and says, well, wait a minute, I don't like that. That doesn't seem right to me. It's contrary to my way of thinking. And there is a way that I do think about it. And that is the understanding of my own heart. And that to me, that sounds right. Not this from the word of God, but my heart. And so I'm going to take my heart and apply that to the word of God and interpret the scriptures through my thinking and my heart. That seems so right to me. And then, because they don't want to be alone in all of this and out there on a branch alone, they try to convince others. And that's how you get a cult. That's how you get a movement. And that's how this happened in Galatia. There are those Jews that were really struggling with this idea that the simple gospel is all that you need and just have faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. That seems just way too easy. The truth about God was contrary to their way of thinking. It seems like you have to do something. By the way, as I read my, my Jewish scriptures and my Old Testament scriptures, it seems like God is asking us to do this and to do that and not do that and not do that. And to be circumcised. And, and, and to follow the, 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 the Sabbath day and the, and the worship of God through the sacrifices. And these are the things that we're supposed to be doing. And as we read the Old Testament, they all were circumcised. And so all of this seems to, you know, as they're looking at this and trying to understand this, just uh, this, this idea that Christ is all and he paid it all. And all we have to do is trust in him just doesn't seem to their way of thinking to be right. They had to do something. And by the way, it was God that commanded them to be circumcised and to keep the law. And this understanding in their heart seemed right to them. It's what they'd been raised uh, to believe from their youth. And so they're going to go ahead and be circumcised and keep the law. Because how could that possibly be wrong? They just wanted, they, they desired to make a fair show to look good in their flesh. So look again at verse number 12. Having said all of this about our heart and understanding all this about our heart and how it is that, that we don't have the same thoughts as God, but we do have our own thoughts and we tend to apply our thoughts to what God's thoughts are and interpret them that way. And so again in verse number 12, as many as desire, they have a desire in their heart. They want to do well. They want to do right. To make, but they want to do it by making a fair show in the flesh. It's not enough for me just to believe. There's got to be something else. There's got to be something that I have to do. It's not done. I have to complete it. I have to finish it. But they didn't want to go it alone. And so they come to Galatia and they're trying to convince others about what it is that they believe. Sure, you can have Messiah. Sure, you can have Jesus. But, but he's not enough. You've got to do these other things. And so they try to convince those there. At Galatia, look again at verse number 12. As many as desire to make a fair show in the flesh, they constrain you. They persuade you. They preach to you this, this other gospel. They can constrain you to be circumcised. Only lest they should suffer persecution for the cross of Christ. In other words, the idea there is that if they somehow come all the way over to the idea that it's all by Christ, then they're going to be ostracized by the Jews that, that don't lead Judaism and don't believe that Jesus is the Messiah, and they're going to be cut off, and they don't want that. That's too far. But what, 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 if, what, if, what if we find a middle ground and we try to bring the two together? Jesus is our Messiah and still doing the things that the law commands us to do. Besides, if they were circumcised and kept the law, then they wouldn't be, again, persecuted by the, by the Jews for their belief that Jesus paid it all on the cross. But, but Paul has proved in his letter that they cannot keep the law He's proved in his letter that even those who are trying to make a fair show have failed. Everyone fails in keeping the law. 
No one can do it. So secondly, I want to talk to you about a failed show. They want to make a fair show. They want to do right. They have a desire to do right, but they're going to fail at it. Look at verse number 13. For neither they themselves who are circumcised keep the law. They don't do it. They don't do as they ought to. They want you to come along, desire to have you circumcised, and bring you into their failure as well because you'll fail too. No one can make it. No one can keep the law. And so no one can be justified by the works of the law. And I want you to see again that he's already proved this. Go back to to chapter number 2, if you would, please, of Galatians. Verse number 16. Now remember here at the end of the, uh, of the epistle, all he's doing is wrapping up and, and bringing out again the problem that, that caused him to write in the first place. The reason why he wrote this with, with his own hand is because of these false teachers that have come. And so he proves throughout the scriptures, throughout the, 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 the letter itself, that you cannot... You cannot be saved by the law. Look at verse number 16 of chapter 2. Knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by the faith of Jesus Christ. You're trying to add to the simple faith of the Lord Jesus Christ, and it cannot be done. Even we have believed in Jesus Christ that we might be justified by the faith of Christ and not by the works of the law. For by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. And so they're coming along and they're adding this the idea of works to the simple faith of the Lord Jesus Christ. It is another gospel. It is a perversion of the true which says that you cannot be just justified by the law. For by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. In fact, the whole idea that the law could justify anyone has never been true. Do you understand that? What do you mean going back to the days of Moses and and, and David? All through the Old Testament, Pastor, you're trying to tell me that the works of the law could never save anybody? That's right. And that's what Paul proves here in Galatians. The whole idea that the law could justify anyone has never been true. Look at chapter 3, if you would, please, in verse number 18. The Bible says, For if the inheritance, that is our inheritance in the family of God, to be born again into the family of God, to become sons, to as many received him, to them gave he the power to become the sons of God. For if the inheritance be of the law, if that's how it comes, it is no more of promise. But God didn't give it originally by the law. He gave it first to Adam by the promise. God gave it to Adam by promise. And you receive a promise by faith. Look back at verse number 6 of chapter 3. Even as Abraham believed by faith, he believed that God is and that he's a rewarder of them that, that diligently seek him, as it says in Hebrews 11. So even as Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him for righteousness, his faith. And so the promise that God gave to Abraham was appropriated by faith. And he received the righteousness of God because of that. It wasn't because of the law. It was because of the promise and faith in the promise. The law was never intended to justify anyone. Now, look at verse number 21 here in chapter 3. Is the law then against the promises of God? Because the promises didn't come by the law and faith has nothing to do with the law. And so salvation has nothing to do with the law. So is the law then against the promises of God? God forbid. No, that's not the case. But here's the point. For if there had been a law given which could have given life, verily righteousness should have been by the law. But because there is no law that giveth righteousness, then righteousness is not by the law. For by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. There is not a law given in the Old Testament that ever was meant to save anyone. 
That's never what the law was meant to do. That's the reason why it was given so many years after the promise. It's almost as though God's saying, look, listen, I'm going to give you a lot of years between the promise with with Abraham and and the law that I'm going to give to Moses so you can let this sink in. It's not the law that's going to bring you into a relationship with me. It's not the law. Okay, God, then what is it? Romans 11. Turn there real quickly. By the way, we call Romans 11 the hall of what? The hall of faith, right? Romans 11. Hebrews 11. Praise the Lord. We call Hebrews 11 the hall of faith, right? And all these that are in the list of the hall of faith are in the New Testament, correct? You guys are following me, aren't you? All of these that are listed, like Abraham... Moses, David, they're all in the New Testament, right? No, they're not. They're in the Old Testament. I was trying to trick Brother Barish and he fell right into it. (laughs) Right? These are Old Testament saints. And this is all the hall of faith that's about them. So it's talking about how a relationship with God was always gained. This is not a New Testament thing. This is an old, this is a Bible thing, right? So look at verse number six of Hebrews 11. But without faith, it is impossible to please him. You know how long that's been true? Always. Always. Even with these Old Testament saints. For without faith, it is impossible to please, please him. For he that cometh to God, there's no way for you to come into a relationship with God without faith. Because he that cometh to God must, what church? You must believe that he is and that he is a reward of them that diligently seek him. So how do we come by God? to God? We come by faith. And that has always been the case. So the law cannot and never will be able to justify anyone. So therefore, any attempt to be justified by keeping the law fails on two counts. Number one, no one can keep the law. And and number two, the law cannot and never will be able to justify anyone. You can't keep the law and the law can't justify you anyway. It was never meant to do that. So their fair show is a failed show. These false teachers know they cannot keep the law. But remember again that the heart is easily convinced of error. Because the truth runs so counter to what seems right to our heart. It just seems logical that God gave the commandments in order for man to be right with God. But their Bible also spoke about a coming Messiah. Jesus showed all the signs of being the promised Messiah. The fact that he rose from the dead proves that he is. Yet the same God that promised and sent the Messiah is the same God that gave the law. Therefore, we must receive the Messiah and keep the law. No, (laughs) but it seems logical. Seems logical to our heart. And that's what gets us in trouble. Because it does seem like, well, God promised a Messiah, but he's the same one that gave the law. And so here's the Messiah, Jesus. He proved that he is by his miracles and by his resurrection from the dead. So, okay, I'll receive that he is the Messiah, but God also wrote about the law. So we need to do the law as well. And they've added it to it. That's what these false teachers have done. But yet it's logical. It makes sense. That's why they were able to win converts. And that's why there was such trouble in the churches of Galatia. God will not accept their logical argument. And their failure to keep the law. Or those that they convinced. None of that will matter to God. So then Paul reminds them that God does accept. He doesn't accept their, 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 uh, their fair show. He doesn't accept their, their failure at their fair show. But he does accept faith. And so let's talk lastly about a faithful show. And we need to hurry. A faithful show. Look if you would please at verse number 14. Back in Galatians chapter number 6. But God forbid that I should glory save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom the world is crucified unto me and I unto the world. 
It is certainly Paul's desire that everyone should be, that he, that he preached to should be saved. He said, I am made all things to all men that I might by all means save some. But he did not measure the truthfulness of his message by the number of people that believed. He wanted them all to be saved, but he didn't say, okay, I'm doing something wrong if they didn't believe what he had to say. He just put it out there and they believed or they didn't. Paul did attempt to persuade men. The Bible says he reasoned in the synagogue every Sabbath and persuaded the Jews and the Greeks, but he did not measure his success by the number of people that uh, that were persuaded by his arguments. In other words, Paul did not preach and persuade in order to have a huge following. That's not why he did it. Paul didn't preach and persuade in order to have a, a uh, to have his name remembered as a great man of history. That's not why he did it. Paul did not find glory in the praise of men or in any of the riches that this world has to offer. He didn't find his glory there. Paul was not seeking the friendship of this world or the acceptance of the religious Jews. His glory was in the Savior, the Savior that he had found who was willing to die for his sins. That's where he found his glory. And that's why he preached. And that's why he persuaded men. The truth was all that mattered to Paul. He would not glory in anything save the message that God had given to him. He would not glory in anything save the cross, to glory in the cross. And in the cross, he too was crucified to this world. So look again at verse number 14. God forbid that I should glory. I wasn't looking for a following. I wasn't preaching and persuading so that I could count the numbers. I don't glory in anything in this life or in this world, save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, the one who loved me and died for for me, by whom the world is crucified under me. All of these accolades, I don't need them. And I am dead unto the world because of the cross of my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And so he said in in chapter 2, verse number 20, I'm crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. That's what Paul gloried in. That is a faithful show. It's not about what I can do. It's not about what I can present to God. It's not about uh, me having some kind of, of work, some kind of fair show to show to God. All of that will fail in the presence of God. What God is looking for is simple faith. To glory in him and not yourself. To glory in him and not this world. To glory in the Christ who gave himself on the cross. To glory in the cross. It's interesting. The false teachers wanted the life that only God can give. And yet they failed to attain to that life because they were attempting to earn it. And you can't earn it. Their fair show was a failed show. There was no glory in their life. Paul also wanted the life that only God can give, and he found it the true way. Crucifixion. He found life through death. Paul found that he had no glory save only in the cross. There is no glory in this world or in our lives. The only glory that we can have before God is the glory that is given to us by his son. And the only way to enter into that glory is through the cross. To be crucified with him. I die daily, Paul said. Really, honestly, it's, it seems strange. But the only way to really truly live in the Christian life is to die. To die to self. To die to this world. And to live unto Christ. Allow him to be your life. And to glory in him. Let's pray.